posted online a bit about how she thinks no one cares about her. So seeing all of this would probably just like make her feel so cared about. Her. This is the true story of Riley Crossman, a happy, caring and talented teenager. A girl with an amazing future within her grasp. Someone that loved her family, her boyfriend, her life. But after going to bed alone one night, she vanished, almost without a trace. What would become of Riley? Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Remember, choosing to be kind can save a life in many ways. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with me. Our love and respect goes out to those that knew and loved Riley and all those affected by this case. Riley Crossman was born on December 22nd, 2003 in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Her mother was Chantel and her father was named Lance. Her family described Riley as beautiful, an innocent soul with a laugh that would fill a room. She was a natural artist, a talented dancer, and it was said that she had the singing voice of an angel. Riley had a real love for babies and children, and they always seemed to love her too. She was a big sister to one little sister and two younger brothers. Being a big sister was perfect for Riley. Her family said that she was a real beacon of light to them and to the world. She was loving, helpful, caring and kind. When Riley hit her teenage years, her family described her as being intelligent and as dramatic as teenage girls come. I think they meant that in a loving way though. That is the reality of being a teenager. Her parents did split up and this gave Riley two new families, one in Martinsburg and one in Barclay Springs. Mother Chantel paired up with boyfriend Andy McCauley and they lived together. Father Lance found love once more as well with Jessica Bishop. By 2019, Riley was now 15 years old and was beginning to transition into the adult world, although she was still very much a fun-loving teenager. She began to date her schoolmate named Hayden. Although a teenage romance, Hayden did seem to genuinely cherish Riley. Riley's parents actually supported the relationship. They could see that Riley was happy with him and they believed she had found a good young man. As her parents were now separated, she did see both parents regularly but she spent most time at her mum's. This meant that she went to school there and built a bit more of a life for herself in that home. Whilst she spent time with both of her parents, she mostly stayed at her mother's place and went to school there too. Other than the previously mentioned normal teenage drama, things were looking good and were only looking to get better. On the 7th of May 2019, Riley had been at school all day. She then returned home at around 3.30pm. As she came in through the door, she saw her mother sleeping on the couch. Mother Chantel was a hard-working woman. She normally worked two jobs to keep the family afloat and the house in order. However, on this day, Chantel was feeling under the weather. She left her first job early so that she could try to recover before starting her night job. After resting up as best as she could, she got herself together and once more went to work. Once Chantelle had left the house, Riley spent a few hours with her grandmother. As time drew on, they separated ways and Riley went up to her bedroom. Mother Chantelle got back from her second job at about 10pm. She saw that door to Riley's door was shut. This wasn't particularly unusual. She could have been busy or maybe she had just crashed out early that night. Chantelle then decided to go to bed herself and try to recover from her illness. The house fell into silence. 
The next morning, now the 8th of May, Mother Chantelle was once more getting ready for work. She noticed that Riley's bedroom door was still closed. This was kind of unusual, but not too disturbing. She decided to just go and check on her daughter, but Riley wasn't there. She checked the rest of the house. Still no Riley. Riley was known to sometimes leave the house early to go to school. Arriving early meant that she could spend some more time with her friends. And more importantly, it meant that she could see her boyfriend, Hayden. Hayden was actually due to go on a field trip that day. So to Chantel, it all kind of added up. Her daughter had gone to spend time with her boyfriend whilst she could. The entire school day passed without anything new coming to light. But then the time came when Riley should have arrived home. As 3.30pm passed, Riley's grandmother noticed that she hadn't yet made it home. This was concerning enough for her to call Chantel. Mother Chantel was concerned and went about tracking Riley down herself. She tried contacting her daughter by text message, but they weren't going through. She tried to call her, but those calls went straight to voicemail. Concern was growing by the second. She contacted the school to see if Riley was still there or if they knew anything else. However, in a moment that must have made her blood run cold, she was informed that Riley never even made it to school that day. Chantelle sprang into action and drove directly to the school. Her last port of call was her daughter's boyfriend, Hayden. She waited in the school parking lot for him to get back from the field trip. And when he arrived, Chantelle hoped that he would be able to shed some light on where Riley was. But she was sorely disappointed. Hayden had gone the entire day without seeing or even hearing from his beloved girlfriend. Far from finding out where Riley was, Chantelle now almost knew even less than she did before. There was no other place to turn other than to the police. She called the police and reported Riley as officially missing. The police force, Riley's family and volunteers from the community all sprang into action. No stone was left unturned in the local area. Time was of the essence to bring Riley home. The school and surrounding areas were intensely searched. The search team combed the neighbourhoods and parks tirelessly. But Riley just seemed to have vanished. There were theories that perhaps she had run away from home. However, we are talking about a 15-year-old here. Riley couldn't drive, she didn't have the finances, and it didn't seem like she had the motive to do so either. She was, to all intents and purposes, happy. Things were going well and it didn't seem realistic that she would leave her mother, father, grandmother, siblings, friends, or Hayden. Perhaps something more sinister was at play. Police looked at the last time that Riley was confirmed to be okay. Riley's grandmother saw and spoke with her on the night of the 7th. And after that, there was only contact made via her cell phone. Riley spoke to her friends and Hayden until around midnight. So we can deduce that when Mother Chantel got home at 10.30pm that night, Riley was in her room and on her phone. But then after that, there was one more sign from Riley. Strange Strangely, at 5.30am, Riley called Hayden. However, understandably, Hayden was asleep and the call went unanswered. Since that call, nobody had heard from or seen Riley Crossman. Police descended on the Crossman home, hoping to shed more light on what could have happened. You mind if we take a look in her bedroom? This is her straight back? Yes, sir. One mirror we have like this, so I came in yesterday morning, and I don't remember them being there. I feel like I would have noticed her boat bag still being here, and especially her glasses, because I, this is not exactly the way it was. I've been in here digging and looking to see if there was a note. The last time you, you saw her? Oh, uh, like nine, maybe ten-ish. At night? Yeah. And, and, what, and what context was that? Oh, uh, she was here at the house. She went to bed probably, well, I don't know what time she went to bed, but she was... All the kids were in the room by like 9 30, 9, 9 30. Did she ever leave in the morning? No. I left four, I got up four o'clock in the morning. That's five. Okay. Police searched the home, much of which was pretty unremarkable. There were no obvious signs that this was a crime scene. 
Upon entering her room, however, something was obviously not right. Furthering the theory that Riley had not run away on her own accord, on her bedside sat her wallet and her glasses. Why would she run away without these essentials? It just didn't make sense. But much darker was reddy brown stains on Riley's bedsheets and pillows. The pillow was tested and it revealed it contained saliva mixed with blood. DNA testing revealed that it belonged to Riley. Police now strongly believed that Riley had been abducted and everyone hoped that she was still alive. The search for Riley went on and the search for her abductor began. On May the 16th, 2019, nine days after Riley was last seen, an update finally came their way. Police received calls of a disturbing scene unfolding near Tuscarora Pike in Berkeley County. A body inside a trash bag was found in a state of decomposition. The clothing pointed towards it being Riley and Mother Chantelle confirmed the clothes were indeed her daughter's. After an autopsy, the worst was confirmed. This was Riley Crossman. However, due to the state that the body was discovered in, police were unable to determine how Riley had met her end, nor could they determine if she had been violated. The fact that Riley was found in a trash bag was just one marker of the crime. She was covered with drywall joiner or some similar white chalky substance. She was wearing just one untied shoe. The other was not at the scene. She wore shorts that were unzipped and unbuttoned. There was the notable absence of a bra and her underwear was ripped. Everything here pointed towards murder. The hunt for Riley's killer was on. Devastation ripped through the family and the community. Everyone was on edge. Who did this and would they do it again? Police spoke once more with Riley's parents and other family members. Even if they weren't guilty themselves, they may have had some much needed information. Everyone they interviewed had watertight alibis. With one exception. In their investigation, police spoke to one neighbour that had some interesting new information. A green truck was seen on the driveway of the Crossman house on the very day that Riley vanished. This truck wasn't known to the neighbour. She knew that Mother Chantel was at her night job and Chantel's boyfriend Andy didn't drive. So the driver of the truck was a mystery. If they knew who drove it, they may have the killer. Back on that day that Riley went missing, Chantelle had noticed something a little strange. When she told her boyfriend Andy that Riley seemed to have gone missing, she said he acted strangely. He didn't seem overly concerned. He instead seemed jittery, nervous. He went into a kind of panic mode, but not a helpful one. She saw him quickly entering the house and grabbing some items. He then left, claiming he was going to look for Riley, just as Chantelle was. And later that night, when Chantel finally made it home after searching for her daughter, she saw Andy pretending to be asleep on the couch. Had he even looked at all? Something felt off. The police spoke with Andy once more. He had some new questions to answer. Andy was taken in for questioning and was asked about where he was on May the 8th. Andy told them that he was at his job just as he should be. But his workmates told a different story. They said that he left for four to five hours in the day, highly suspicious. Andy then took this as a chance to change his story. What was the last time you saw him? 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.
this is one of these times you need to really sit down and think about what you're going to say. Um, so you want to rethink what you just told me. One thing I'm going to not do to you is lie to you. I promise you that. I will never lie to you. I'm not going to make up. Okay? Don't do that to me. I'm not trying to. Okay, okay. You're not trying to. Let's try this again. Let's go back. I know it's been a couple days. I know a lot has happened. Okay, get that. I understand that. He now said that yes, he had left his job. And he did so to go and buy illicit substances from a dealer. And one workmate said that his excuse for leaving was actually to go and meet a girl. His story was in tatters and couldn't stand up to the most gentle probing. Is there a reason in your mind that you would think that she would tell her boyfriend that she's afraid of you? No. Something going on that night and you don't get into any sort of argument? No. She FaceTimes her boyfriend all the time. You know what's that, right? What if I told you her last text to her boyfriend were saying don't talk because she still has the FaceTime one? And he's in here. I'm afraid. That's what it said. What if I told you that? Obviously, that's crazy. 100%. Obviously, that's crazy. She lives in the same house you're in? Yes. Okay. Besides her boyfriend and mom, and her brothers, you probably have the most access to it. Right? I guess, if that's what you want to say. Well, I mean, it, it's true, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. The floodgates now opened and a wave of evidence came to light. The green truck that the neighbour saw pull up to the house was identified. It belonged to Andy's workmate. The truck was subsequently searched and revealed some damning finds. The chalky white filler substance that was found on Riley's body was also found in the truck, along with some sheet metal screws. Two of this exact type of screw were also found at the scene that Riley was discovered at. Specialist cadaver dogs also matched a scent from the scene to the truck. CCTV from around the time that Riley went missing also didn't help Andy's case at all. Andy was seen driving the green truck to locations near the crime scene. There was no evidence of him meeting the dealer, as he said. When the locations revealed on the CCTV were cross-referenced with Andy's cell phone location, this just opened up another can of worms. His phone records revealed that he had been contacting workmates to try and secure somewhere to stay. Weirdly, one colleague that he tried it on with didn't even really get along with him. So this presented as odd and desperate. Andy just seemed to desperately want to distance himself from the Crossman household. The picture being painted was extremely dark. In September 2021, over two years since Riley's passing, the case went to trial. Andy was on the hook for first-degree murder, concealment of a body, and crimes against a minor. The prosecution got to work. Along with 239 pieces of evidence and 25 people willing to testify against Andy, this is what they believe happened. On Riley's final night, she was messaging boyfriend Hayden. Hayden recounted how Riley was saying that Andy was in the house. He seemed to be high on illicit substances and he was going in and out of Riley's room. She said that she was scared of him. The prosecution claimed due to his illicit substance usage, his judgement was impaired. He then attempted to violate Riley, smothering her with a pillow as he did so, until she was no longer breathing. After some weak defence and a plea for a 15-year sentence, Andy was found guilty on all charges and was handed down two life sentences, with no chance of parole. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Let me know down in the comments. Please do hit like now if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Thank you to everyone in the Dark Case crew. You too can become a channel member for just 99p. A huge thank you to my 
patrons, your support makes a massive difference. You too can support my work and be thanked in every video for just $5 per month. So thank you to Rachel David, Kathy Green, David James, Addy Alexander, Karen Jones, El Palmieri, James Harrington, Shane Woodward, Faster River, Stacey Krogerus, Summer Chambers, Mona Corona, Sefiad Variable, Anthony Watson, Jason Coward, Guardian Paler, Jeremy Sebrenek, Joy Burton, Dawn Croc, Michelle Mims, Natalie Lundquist, Anita Ford, and Darlene. Be careful out there, and I'll see you soon.